Now, let me legally address this. And, and we, 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 let, let's put that yes. part of that. Let, uh, can you, can we, you, we, 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 do you we, have we, copies of my motion? Yes. And we, we, the Attorney we, General we, may have filed his search around 9, 9.15, if you check the date. The search was, was answered around 9, 9.45. People are not looking at the second page where you have the registered certification. Mm -hmm. The search was entered, answered by the registrar around 9.45. Anybody who knows how court registry works, we got to the court. Look, I want to believe we got to the court. We went to the court on the Wednesday to file my application. If you want to hear the things that happened, I don't think you'll be interested. Conspiracies have come. I, why? I went to the court. You, know you were not there. No, say no, 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 no. So if, 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 if you want to hear the things that will happen on Wednesday, yes, that's very, very important. The Wednesday, yeah. you don't want to hear them. No, please go ahead. Today, that's to the, the most extent important. that when you file a motion, mm. somebody, another officer, must issue a hearing notice attached to it. You are aware? Yes. Mm. You want to hear why that mm. was not done? Why was it not done? So, so please, the most important thing is that the Attorney General is making a food soldier argument about the process. Oh, how? And yes, and it's very sad. How? And it's very sad that the Attorney General and the Minister of Justice of the Republic of Ghana will be making such arguments. But address the matter. Yes, I'm addressing the so matter. That's before the, 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 oh, that's can the, the before can the that, oh, okay. Exactly, oh, okay. I'm saying that the Attorney General oh, oh, oh. has decided to leave his law. No, I'm saying that before. And make political that and food soldier act. Oh, okay, okay. okay. That night so, when so speaker this is, made please, the had you filed? Please. Gentlemen, hold on, hold on. Please, please. Can you, can you, do you know when I file my rate? No, no, no. asking you, just answer. Do you know when I file my rate? No indicators, had you filed? That night. I am saying, I am saying that notice of do, do you know what? Do you listen? Listen, don't you, you are daring so, me. So, wait, no, 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 it's, not, it's a matter of you are daring me. No, and I'm that saying that go ahead. there's no way. I'm daring you go ahead. I'm a professional. I'm daring you go ahead. Then 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 you, then you, then you, then you then when you were talking, I was quiet. So, you interrupted as I didn't interrupt. I was invited. So, you conduct yourself. It's okay. Conduct yourself. Yes. Let me just establish that this is what we were talking about earlier, as seen in the on the screen. So, where it's said. Is, is, is that is the time of your application and that's what you're explaining yes that um, the top circle is the 1015 yes that you filed on the 21st yes of, of this month yes right and I'm saying and, yes first of all fundamentally when you get to a court registry the registrar can decide to prioritize some other forces over yours okay. they do it all the time so anybody who want to belabor the point that a search Right. A search that was filed at 9.15 and answered at 9.45 or right. 42 a.m. Mm -hmm. And another process that was filed 15 minutes or 30 minutes later were not contemporaneous, then the person doesn't know how, 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 how can please know, have a notice a day before. And, I'm, and, I'm, okay. and I'm telling you that okay. when a process comes, it comes together. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 uh, miracles, Abuaji, you can do all the politics, but, but let me politics? answer you legally. Yes. The Attorney General couldn't have written the kind of things he wrote if he was thinking legally. Okay, why do you he say He was so? not thinking legally. Why? He was thinking politics. Why? He told that the filing of a writ meant nothing in, mm -hmm. in, in the circumstances of this case. The Attorney General is saying that mm -hmm. where I am making an allegation that a constitutional breach has occurred in respect of the appointments of nominees of the president for purposes of Article 78 and 79 executive positions. And I'm saying that in one communication to parliament, you have communicated to parliament that you have nominated certain persons for purposes of parliamentary pre approval for appointment as ministers of state. In the same communication, you are notifying parliament that you have reassigned certain ministers that you have dismissed prior. And I'm saying that it's the same exercise, the same function, it's the same action. So you couldn't have been asking Parliament to acquiesce his right of checking the breach of the Constitution. When Parliament does that, it's an omission. Okay. And Parliament cannot be, cannot be, cannot be condoning a breach of the Constitution. That's my allegation. Then the Attorney General says that my, my relief in respect of an in injuncting the vetting process of those nominees is not related to the persons that are making allegations that they should come for prior approval. How does that make some sound logic and legal reasoning? One action, one communication to parliament, 
a number of persons nominated are being brought to parliament for uh, uh, vetting and for purposes of prior approval process. Then you added that some six persons, and um, my allegation is that you have dismissed those people. So there's no way they were, they were occupying a ministerial portfolio for which you can shift them. So mm -hmm. you know, if I if I want if I want to deal with that matter, I must deal with the matter holistically. Well, not the AD, in the, the AD says you misinformed the Speaker of Parliament. Why am I the court belief? It's part of the problems I have with the reasoning of the Attorney General. Am I the one who misinformed who 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 served who served, who served the Speaker or served Parliament in this matter? Why is the AG making political arguments in legal issues? What is, what is the agency's interpretation of a writ properly filed invoking the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court? Is that the interpretation the AG is, 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 is edging on us? It's a very sad day for the office of the AG in this country that an attorney general of his standing can do this because of politics. He doesn't see the connection between the exercise parliament is engaging and my and my and my and my action in court, he doesn't see the linkage, the direct linkage, and how the two are inextricably woven together. Well, I think no, I think every lawyer worth his salt understands what's happening, except the attorney general. And of course, he wants to do that because he's living his law and he's talking politics. I want to play what exactly the attorney general said in that interview with my colleague, Joseph Akable. Just take a look at that, an aspect of that interview. And I would ask you a question about whether, just in his words, a mere reference of an intention to apply for intellectual injunction amounts to an intellectual injunction in itself. Take a look at this. Indeed, if I were those affected, I think that we even have a cause of action against, 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 against Parliament, against the, the persons who are, who are contending so. Because if I have been, if I were not a minister and had been nominated for ministerial appointment, what, how justified is it for a person to restrain Parliament from considering my approval simply because he has a case against some other persons who, who, who are not in Parliament? I mean, I think that wholly unrelated, and I think this country must be very analytical in the way we, we think and do things, and we must also stop unnecessary politicking. And when that is done, I think the nation will develop. I mean, finally, as Attorney General, um, there are those who make the point that the issues that have been raised have been settled in judgments of Attorney General. Uh, do you share that view, or you still think that there's a matter that perhaps uh, has been presented differently, maybe the court may take a different view? I hold the view that there's no genuine issue for constitutional interpretation whatsoever. There's no genuine case for constitutional interpretation whatsoever. Apart from the fact that some of the issues, I mean, who partly has been determined in, um, the issue partly has been determined in J.H. Mr. Atenjura, there's actually no case at all for constitutional interpretation. If at all, it's actually a case for, 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 for um, um, semantics or grammatical interpretation. And that is not the threshold for a constitutional action. If the president revokes a minister's appointment and reassigns that minister to another ministry. If you do not understand it correctly, and you think that that implies in English language that it means a cessation of the minister's appointment by the president, the president does not have the right to then reappoint, so be it. It raises no issue for constitutional interpretation whatsoever. That's the Attorney General responding to aspects of this, of this suit that you have filed. And he indicates in that statement the issue that you, the plaintiff, you have not filed as of the time an application for interlocutory injunction seeking to restrain the speaker from going ahead with the approval of the names of the persons submitted by His Excellency the President. Thus, there is nothing before the Supreme Court as of the time which may constitute a restraint or fetter on Parliament from proceeding with the approval of these ministerial nominees. Um, it has made reference to in accordance with Article 78.1 and 79.1 of the Constitution that every application for interlocutory injunction or relief in any of the Supreme Courts as a trite must be by a motion. Is that what we call? 
specifically filed and prayed for desired relief, the mere statement on a writ of summons of a prayer for interlocutory injunction relief is inconsequential and of no effect. <laughs> Okay. That is the verdict of the Attorney General. Yes, uh, and I'm happy that is the opinion of the Attorney General, and it enters his door. You but, just, but, you but, 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 an interlocutory tree or an interim injunction against speaker from proceeding was enough. Yes. And that's absolutely. the law. That is the law. That, that is the law that again? that is the law that Martin quoted yes. heavily and relied yeah. on. So I didn't want to bore you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Attorney General can sit in his yeah. chambers and do his politics. And that's why I'm also he, not happy now, with that. Today the Attorney General says that mm, those ministers yet. have a cause of action against me. Indeed. <laughs> I welcome it. They should they should go to court. The Attorney General is refusing to see the unconstitutional conduct of the President. What is the unconstitutional conduct? The unconstitutional conduct, of the conduct is that on a very fine morning on 14 February, the President told the whole country, the whole world, that he has dismissed some number of ministers. That's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. He has power, however, to make fresh appointments, which he has done. But he hasn't got the power to dismiss people and seek to reassign them. Mm. I am saying that you can't use language like that. When you want to appoint, say you are, you are making fresh appointments, which are subject to par pro parliamentary approval. He wants to use language to avoid the constitutional strictures in pro parliamentary approval. That is my point. I will not allow it. And parliament too will not condone such unconstitutionality. And he sees and, 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 and he's messing his law up. Today, the Attorney General of the Republic of Ghana says that a writ, properly, pro properly so-called, properly invoking the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court with an injunctive relief as part of the main relief means nothing. Well, uh, uh, counsel, uh, uh, I, uh, no, no, I know, no. just two seconds, just to provide some information. Quickly. I think that, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to a principal actor in this case. So we'll leave that to him. But most importantly, that fundamental question, that fact, is important that it's not twisted. When you listen to the speaker, you play this word. The speaker was quite um, categorical. At some point, he said that until after the determination of the application for interlocutory injunction by the Supreme Court, and this was made on the 20th um, of March, 2024, what this is saying is that the speaker is saying, as at the time he was speaking that evening, he had received or seen an application, or he has been served of an application for interlocutory injunction by the Supreme Court. We are saying that that is false. And that the application for the interlocutory injunction by Honorable Roxin Dafir Mepo was made on 21st March. Dafir okay. Mepo, in this case, might not have committed any crime. The real person who has questions to answer is the speaker. And if there's anybody right. playing politics, it is the speaker who is playing politics for making reference to something that he had not seen or something that was going to happen oh, in the future. Okay, thank you. That so, is so, a fact. So there, there was, me, a, there was me, a point let that... Let me, let me answer. There was a specific reference answer. that Lawyer Martin Pebble made speaker, in speaker responding to this. Yes. Okay. The first English word speaker used was that he... Or phrase, he said he has received a court process. Yes. In official capacities, you're always informed. The information may not be entirely... <laughs> Entirely accurate, but he has received information that a court process has been set. I'm not an application for interlocutory injunction. Yeah, ah, I think we should be fair. But, okay. but I'm saying, okay. you are, but I'm saying, okay. Okay. Hold on. but I'm saying, your you, president, you, you, eh? the okay. president, you are struggling no, 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 too. No, no, I am not struggling. So, 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 I, I am not struggling. You are doing politics with the speaker. No, no, is anybody no, doing politics? No, okay, is the speaker not struggling? He is the one who traveled. Hold on. I am in the house. When you speak, but you, I was the one speaking, and you interrupted. Hold on. 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 That lawyer Martin Pebble made in, a, in, the, in the provision that I want it reiterated because mm. of this issue of the timing and whether or not the, the mayor statement as captured in, in there or 
supports the relief of interlocutory injunction in any of the Supreme Court, for that matter, as captured in the Attorney General's statement, that indeed every application by multiple people for interlocutory relief in any of the Supreme Courts, as it tried, must be by a motion specifically filed and praying for desired relief. Does that statement on a rate of summons of Nelson Dafia Mekbo, of a prayer for interlocutory relief, have any consequential effect? Absolutely. It does? Yes. You see, um, let, let's put it this way. Just uh, let's get this first point from the, to lay the basis for it in the uh, Bank of Ghana case, the one that uh, committed Governor Addison and the bank. Listen, you see, the Supreme Court says this. Uh, the ju judicial power, and the Supreme Court is saying it's also using Article 125, Clause 3. The judicial power of Ghana, by Article 125, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution, has been vested in the judiciary. Let, let me go straight to their point. So they're saying that when a court is seized with jurisdiction to hear a matter, okay. nothing should be done to usurp the judicial power that has been vested in the court by the Constitution of Ghana. In effect, the state of affairs before the court was seized with the matter must be preserved until the court delivers its judgment. Uh -huh. Now listen, mm. this is so whether or not the court has granted an order to preserve the status quo or not. Let's repeat, this is a court mm. case which will have the effect of interfering with the fair trial of the case or undermine the administration of justice. So mm. Daphne Oko said, I want X, Y, Z. That's why I told you that no matter how bogus, okay, you've read it. Everybody said, ah, this is, ah, what is this? Even some people say, ah, is this a competent lawyer? Whatever. The more you get angry at what you are reading, the more you should be circumspect because you are not the judge. Okay. Don't take the law into your hands like the Attorney General is asking Parliament to do. And I'm shocked that an Attorney General would tell Parliament that ignore court process. I write to you, Balugu versus Eduse. Eduse was a minister. The court convicted him. Dumbo was a minister. The court convicted him. I wonder if the Attorney General, why didn't he quote those cases? And look at them. Okay. And the Supreme Court referred to these cases in the Bank of Ghana case. Listen, even in the Balugun case, Justice Bafuboni says that they are not even sure that Krobo Eduse had been saved. And listen, in contempt, it doesn't even matter that you are not aware of the case. Who. So when I read the Attorney General's sin, I will agree with Dafia Meko that Attorney General was playing politics. Okay. In contempt, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Okansi, let's mm -hmm. repeat. It doesn't matter that you don't even know that the case is before the court. In the contempt. only thing that mm -hmm. can happen if you are not aware well, of the, uh, the proceedings is that the punishment will be small. small. Uh -huh. it, it's a mitigating it could, it factor. Mm. Yes, but it, as for committer, you'll be committed, or we say convicted. And the Supreme Court is saying, this is best one to Article 125. So okay. if you hear an argument like, oh, when it comes to constitutional functions, you cannot use an application for injunction to stop it, then you don't understand what the Supreme Court is saying. They say the meaning of Article 125 Clause 3 is that when a matter is brought to court, stop. So right. if you come and tell me that, oh, this particular function I'm exercising is a constitutional function, so you cannot use ordinary injunction to stop, then please go and read uh, Benjamin Dufour versus Bank of Ghana. And you see, the thing about it is that the Supreme Court, it's not right. just one. So you see Bafuboni, every now and then he repeats it. it look, I can go on and on apart from page ruling. 10. Yes, he keeps mm. repeating the point. So please, the interpretation of Article 125 Clause 3 is that the meaning of putting a matter before the, uh, the courts of Ghana is that once a matter has been brought, don't usurp their power. Usurping okay. their power is a breach of Article uh, 125, Clause uh, 3. Uh, yes. Okay. So but then, okay, if I, 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 I no, gentlemen, no, 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 no you, 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 you wait, wait, you will. All of you, you will have your back. No, I, 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 I make reference to, no, 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 you, you will conclude because this is, we are not ending this matter. Let me bring in Justice Shem sign because, you see, that but reference that you made, you make, yeah. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm yeah. coming, I'm coming. Gentlemen, hold on. Please. Um, that Justice Buffalo Bonnie ruling that you make is indeed the case mm. that the number of times, about five times or so, mm. what mm -hmm. I'm reading, mm. 
he makes reference to this this particular aspect that you re referenced minutes mm. ago. Mm. Justice Shemsai, now, is it based on the foundation I have given in this particular case of that, the lawyer Daphne Amepo and the Attorney General's position as espoused in that statement that he received, relieved, uh, received earlier? Uh, is it correct to say, respectfully, that the suit is, in this case, lawyer Daphne Amepo's suit is not properly constituted in accordance with rules 46.3? of the CI-16 to the extent that such an act will be struck out where a statement of case in support of the plaintiff's writ is not filed within 14 days? Um, thank you very much. I think the, the rule is very clear on this and there are case laws that, I mean, cases that support the proposition that when you file a writ, you are not bound I mean, in the Supreme Court, when you file a race in the Supreme Court invoking the original jurisdiction, you are not bound to file your statement of case at the same time. You have 14 days within which to file your, your statement of case. Now, when you fail to file your statement of case within that 14 you know, day period, the defendant has the uh, opportunity to file a motion to strike out the, the rate. Now, what that means is that until the defendant files, you know, the a motion to strike out the, the, the rate, uh, the, the rate is active. So it is not correct to suggest or to say that when you file a rate at the Supreme Court invoking the original jurisdiction of the, of the court and you've not filed a statement of case, that rate is ineffective or is incapable of or is impotent. The rate remains impotent potent until such a time that the court will strike it out. So I think that is the correct proposition, uh, the correct position of the law. Now, the, the problem we seem to be having in respect of injunction is that, you see, injunction itself is a discretionary remedy. Yes, we have rules that govern the, the discretion which is used to grant injunction. And the rules, all of them, if you watch, if you read every injunction case properly decided, you will see that the judges are referring to the nature of the, sub, of, of the subject matter or the nature of what we are preserving. So the court will not say that there is an injunction merely because um, uh, there is an injunction. Uh, inter the court will not, the, the, the principle used to decide interim injunction, interlocutory injunction, and all, and, 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 and those intermediate injunctions. They are the same. It's basically like uh, Martin Pebble said. They are basically to preserve, you know, the subject matter. So even if you file your 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 motion and the motion, if you file a case and there's a ultimate or final, you know, relief of injunction, the courts are going to treat that relief as if it is something you want to preserve pending the determination of the case. That is interlocutory. Now, why are we even here in the first place? Courts look at cases in totality before they, 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 they place an order of injunction. And there are decisions which also say that the mere fact that someone has filed, you know, a case, okay, someone has filed a case and has filed an application for an injunction, it doesn't mean that then someone who has the right to do something should automatically stop. There, there are cases to that effect. And there are cases that also say that, look, once somebody files the motion, I mean, once someone files the case and the relief in the case means, I mean, requires an injunction, you are not supposed to do anything that will overreach, you know, the court. So there are cases like that. There are cases also that say that, look, when you file a case and you don't file an interlocutory, you know, injunction, the other party is not bad from doing what they want to do. But what, we, what this, all these cases have in common and what we, we don't seem to be addressing is that the court made this pronouncement depending on the nature of the act which is in question. So the, there's no one statement that covers all situations. So let's give an example. If I'm here today and I file an injunction and I, and I file a case where I'm saying that TV3 should not, uh, TV3 should not broadcast a particular, I mean, should not broadcast for a particular period. Now look at it. 
TV, TV3 was stopped broadcasting merely because I have gone to court on an allegation that they shouldn't do something. You know, that is what the, the principal we said that once the case is filed, you should stop, you know, uh, you should stop whatever you are doing pending the determination of the case. But these are some of the consequences that you can have. Some of them are really absurd. And, and even if a court and a court will not, court will not, you know, will, the law is not that much of an ass as we used to, we, we seem to say. That is why all, in all cases, we need to consider the nature of the act in question. And that is why this case is becoming, you know, complicated. It's becoming complicated because if, if we have to go by the principle that the Attorney General advised the President of that, anytime there is a, a parliamentary procedure, okay, and someone has a problem with any part of the procedure and goes to court and seeks an injunction, then everything must stop pending the determination of the case. Do you know the effect of that on, 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 on governance and, and everything? And, and here, we are not even talking about uh, the issue of, we are, we are not even talking about uh, financial consequences. I was in court one day when, you know, one of the cases that we are doctor, um, one of the LGBT cases, and the court was repeatedly asking the, the applicant that, are you telling us that because you have filed, you know, because you have filed this case, parliament should stop legislating on the matter? So is this the Amanda, the Amanda Odoi case? Yes, Dr. Amanda Odoi. You know, the, the, what people don't know is that this case had gone to the Supreme Court with an injunction application, and the Supreme Court had dismissed, you know, the, the injunction application against the speaker. That was oh. somewhere last year or so, either last year or early this La, year. Last year, August, I think. It was August, exactly. there about. Yeah, so so when we come back today, and so and, and what was the reason for the court's decision? The court was basically telling the plaintiff that, we have to weigh the balance of what? Convenience. You, I mean, suspending the work of parliament, which affect the whole country, as against your claims in the in the rates, which is you alone. Which one do you think we should do? Those were the questions the court was asking. And, and that is exactly what the court asked was, you know, uh, injunction application. They'll be asking you questions. Do you think that when we do this, as compared to allowing the, which one is having more, you know, more severe, you know, consequences. Those are the things that we look at. And I am particularly surprised that the Attorney General, after advising the President to not do anything pending the determination of the matter, will turn around and say that when it comes to the case of the Speaker, the Speaker must do, must continue to, to act, even though the case has not been decided. And all these issues about the time of filing, the time of doing this, uh, when it was it conducted a search, I mean, you see, let's not go into those aspects because if we go there, there are so many things that we can bring out which the public will be disappointed, you know, in. I mean, if I file, if I go to court today and I file a search, do you know how long it takes me to get a search report on the average? You know, it takes me, no, it takes no, 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 no less than a week to get a search report. So if you are telling me that someone goes to court and he is able to file a search in the morning and by 30 minutes time or whatever, he has the report of the court or, or of, the, of the search. I mean, what does that tell you? So let, let's not even, I don't want us to even go to those details, but the main issue before us is, and, and I think I like this line of cases and I like what is going on because it will give the Supreme Court an opportunity to make a pronouncement on some of these issues because every day these things come up and we are not really sure whether because someone has gone to court, we should stop acting in a particular way. Hmm. Or because someone has filed an injunction, we should stop acting. And, and, and look, from where I sit, okay, from where I sit, it is very difficult for me to be convinced, okay? It is very difficult to be for me to, to be convinced that merely because someone goes to court on an issue, a constitutional command, okay, a hmm. constitutional command which is meant to deal with national issues, should you stop because someone is in court when the court itself has not made any order, you know? And so, so I, I think that these cases, these number of cases are very important. And I'm happy that we are all dealing with, we are all asking these questions because I believe by the end of these cases, the Supreme Court will make a very definite pronouncement on this issue, whether when someone is commanded by the constitution to do something, another person can go to court and merely because he has filed an, an application for an injunction or is seeking an injunctive relief, the, the, the person should stop acting and wait for the court to decide the matter. Secondly, 
And I think our, our court system, our Supreme Court must also um, begin to uh, look at some things. I, I have seen in the in the US, okay, and that, not just in the US, in other jurisdictions, some cases carry agent, agents, you know, some cases are treated as agents, even in the courts. So a couple of weeks ago, there was a case where there was a standoff between the Texas, you know, Texas uh, Army <clears throat> versus the United States Army concerning the border. Mm -hmm. Within a couple of days, the cases were the cases were filed in the U.S. Supreme Court and were decided, and 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 the court gave its decision. And I think that we there must be a way of of treating some of these cases with some level of you know agency rather than letting them lie down just like any other ordinary case. There must be there definitely must be a way because all cases don't have the same effect. And all cases mm -hmm. are not necessarily, yes, justice is blind to whatever, but the administration of justice also means that we must, we must be responsive to some issues. I, I, I would honestly be expecting that by now, at least some of these injunction applications would have been decided. Because if we want to hold the principle that, if we want to hold the principle that the mere filing of an injunction, an injunction could, is enough to stop a constitutional command from being performed, then we, the court should be responsive in the sense that when such injunctions come, the court will quickly hear them and discharge and, and determine the matter so that public business or governance can go on. But if we are going to hold that principle that when someone files an injunction, then everything must stop, including constitutional commands, and we are not going to be very responsive to it, then we are causing harm to, to, to governance. And that will affect all of us, including the courts and even the, the, the whole system of government. So I think there must be a way of resolving these issues. And I think these cases present to us an opportunity to settle these things once and for all. And that is the positive thing about what is going on. Uh, secondly, you see, I have observed our attorney general over a long period, over some period of time. And I think that, you see, attorney general is supposed to be for the republic, OK? An attorney general is an attorney general for the whole republic, for the whole state. There is a difference between being a regime lawyer you see, when you're a regime lawyer, your, your primary objective is to do everything that it takes, okay, to keep the regime going. And that, that, that's different from being an attorney general. Attorney general is supposed to be someone who sits behind and observes the national implication of everything and gives an advice and try to actually you know, reconcile differences. During this, the term of this attorney general, there have been more disputes between arms of government, especially parliament and the executive, than any other attorney general. Why, why, why so? So because the attorney general's advice seems to be tailored in a particular way to protect regime interests rather than national interest. And so, and that is one thing we all need to be, to be concerned about. If your attorney general is the leader of the bar, all of us, he lists every lawyer, his opinions are heavy on the court. When you go to court with, with, with an attorney general, you're on the other side. The courts are going to give the attorney general priority in most cases. That is not to say that they are going to give him rulings or decisions. But in the administration of the case, the attorney general have overwhelming advantage. That is because of the weight of the office of the attorney general. The attorney general is seen as someone who is representing the national interest. And his words sometimes even carry weight when he's speaking from the bar. What he says in terms of fact, the court hardly question you know, the, the, the attorney general. But when you have a situation where the attorney general seems to be given, even when he gives advice to the executive and the speaker benefits for, you know, seeks to apply the same advice, he quickly writes another letter to tell the speaker that, no, this is not for you to benefit from it, it's for the president to benefit from. It doesn't work that well for the office. And I think that we shouldn't be seen as a regime attorney general rather than, we should be seen as a national attorney general. The office comes with, with a lot of responsibility. And I think that is what we should be focused on from, from that, 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 that perspective. So, so for you, to the extent that, yes, there's a fundamental legal principle that no two cases are the same, to the extent that the Attorney General advises the President not to go ahead with accenting the anti-LGBTQ plus bill into law because of these pending cases at the Supreme Court, that same brush or that same principle should be applied in the cases of, of the approval of the ministers because there is this uh, Nelson wasn't a fair pursuit in court. That, that is exactly so. Personal, I've already told my personal position. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that the mere fact that someone has filed a motion in, 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 in court, you know, seeking to stop a constitutional command from being performed, 
then that constitutional command must stop pending the determination of the case. I don't believe, I, I don't subscribe to that school of thought. But I know of decisions of the courts that upheld that, and I know decision of the court that will be support the position I'm taking. My point, my point, however, is that when you're an attorney general, you give an advice, and advice is implemented. You don't turn around and tell another person that, no, you are not supposed to do it. And based on what? Based on the fact that that person's relief is not interlocutory and that his relief is on the final rate. So, I mean, that kind of distinction is even petty and, and it doesn't, doesn't really you know, sustain any, uh, any water because the truth of the matter is that the court's objective, even courts can give injunction without any application. Courts can look at the case and by themselves decide that, no, the nature of this case requires me to stay you to stop you from doing this, pending the termination of the matter. So if the purpose of an injunction is to prevent people from overreaching the court, then it won't matter whether it was an interim injunction, interlocutory application, or final injunction. The purpose is the same. So for the Attorney General to turn around and say that in the president case, his is uh, what interlocutory injunction has been filed, and in the in the what in your case, yours is just final relief, then you are supposed to carry on and can overreach the, the courts while the president cannot carry on and overreach the court. And do you remember that this same issue came up with the 11? What advice did the Attorney General give the president when he was signing the 11? So you see, the Attorney General's behavior is, is lacking the consistency that law requires. It, it appears that he's doing more of regime you know, advice. It's like a, a private person advising a private client on how to weave through situations. But that is not, that, that is not, I don't think that is the office, the job of the Office of Attorney General to be, to be doing so. Uh, a number of things you have said is quite consistent with uh, the issues that have been raised here, but there's a point of departure which you, you disagree with Lawyer Martin Pebble's uh, uh, position earlier about the president not accenting to this anti LGBTQ plus bill because uh, this interlocutory injunction cases in court. Lawyer, the, that's the point of departure, but yes. I just wanted to make a very quick point because I need to go for a quick break and come back. Yes. Yes. So uh, that's why I've already made the point that, mm -hmm. please, um, uh, so Dr. Sai, as I read, Article 125, Clause 3, the Supreme Court says that that is it. That is their interpretation. Wait. So we can no longer place another part of the Constitution above Article 125, Clause 3. No. They are very clear. For emphasis, you heard them. They say 125. Uh, if, yeah. if I may quickly make this point. Yeah. If I may quickly make this one, yes, when I was right. making my point, if, if I may make yes. I my position is not that we should disregard the Supreme Court decision on, on the matter. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that the decision, I'm questioning, you know, I'm questioning the, 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 the decision in the sense that if that position is to be carried through, it has consequences. We must be ready to accept the consequences that when we decide that that is what we are going to be doing, then we should be ready for the fact that governance may not be able to proceed. Oh, okay. And, if that position, and I said another thing that mm -hmm. if that position is supposed mm -hmm. to be, if, if that position is supposed to stand, yeah. then there must be a system mm -hmm. of expediting action on such applications. Okay. Yes. But if keep that position and will not decide cases on time and cases can last for a year two or sometimes you know then then the, clearly there's a problem with the with the with the, with the position you know okay. in, in the case i, I, I think that that's so that's where the, because you mm -hmm. advise mm -hmm. council uh chair of your report to apply for an expedition no. yes an expedition exactly so we are aligned for the abridgment of time yes okay. yes so second point just briefly so on the interlocutory uh relief that uh on our Honorable Dafemme Court put mm -hmm. on the thing. Samson says, Ladia Yenini, mm -hmm. he says he was in court and there was a case involving the EC and they said such a relief is sufficient. It's yeah. sufficient. It's sufficient okay. that you put that interlocutory relief. And you know, it's an old thing. So me, I'm even happy Samson mm -hmm. saw one in the Supreme Court. You see, in our practice as lawyers, when you come and meet very good seniors doing that thing, you as a young man, you should be yeah. very slow to think this is yeah. wrong. You, you know it. No, so there's precedence, you there's, mean? There's precedence. I mean, I to... saw it 70 years ago. You see it very often. You see the old lawyers put it there. They do it for a good purpose. Then somebody will come today and see, seek to say that, oh, I know it better than the old people. Meanwhile, you can't even cite one case that says that it should not be done. <laughs> okay. that, that's the thing. Right. Uh, thank you. And, 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 and to, uh, to add to that. Justice, to, 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 to add to that. In a minute, quickly. I, 
I have I have been in court in my own case where a judge warned the other party that mm -hmm. where a judge warned the other party that if 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 there is a there is a, a relief for injunction in the writ. So if you go ahead and you do what you are you, you think you want to do, regardless of the fact that there is no formal application for interim or interlocutory injunction, I am going to cite you for contempt mm -hmm. and warn the person. Which is the so that is why you cannot say that without a formal application for interlocutory injunction, a court cannot use you know a, a, an injunctive relief on the rate to, to to sanction you. In fact, even without any injunctive relief, Excellent. the court can itself yeah. you know can itself give you give, give uh, other parties to refrain from doing things that will prejudice the case or overread the decision of the court. Excellent. Okay. Dr. Justice Shams, I thank you. But stay with me. I'll go for this quick break. When we're back, there's an aspect of that exclusive interview with the Attorney General that you'd want to stay with us and hear because it brings up other questions. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. This is key point.